Hello everyone, and welcome again to The Hugonauts, where we review and discuss with you the best sci-fi novels of all time. And this week we have a doozy, one that is uh, across the lines of sci-fi and literature, um, and that is A Scanner Darkly by Philip K. Dick. Brent, you want to tell us what happens in this one? Published in 1977, it's 220 pages, nine hours if you're listening on audiobook. And it's about Substance D, a new drug sweeping the nation and slowly destroying the corpus callosum of its users. And as that connection between the two halves of their brain starts to degrade, they grow increasingly disoriented, confused, and eventually suffer irreversible brain damage. So we got to do something about that. Fred is an undercover narcotics agent who is working to uncover where the new drug is coming from. What's the source? But to find that source, he has to pose as Bob Arctor, a user. But soon, Arctor is as addicted as the junkies around him. So will he be able to see through his psychosis long enough to tell which are the real leads and what's imagined? Or will he be consumed like his friends by substance D? Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and before we get into Scanner Darkly too far, um, let's talk about next episode. That's going to be Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury in our year of dystopian classics. Uh, you know, toward the end of the year, we'll have done all of them and we will rank them for viewer pleasure or listener. For um, sure. And we also have an announcement. Yeah, we want to thank everybody. So we had we hit two huge milestones like at the same time, basically, this week. We have a thousand average downloads on every podcast episode and a thousand subscribers on youtube so youtube's still like not quite as popular as the podcast but it's moving on up anyway thank you so much to all of you it's been so fun talking with with everybody um on that note if you're not on the discord please please do join if you want to chat with us it's so nice to turn the huguenots into not just like a one-way street but also a conversation to talk about these great books and all sorts of other fun sci-fi stuff so anyway thank you everybody fun to see it keep growing um yeah it's just great and if you log on to Discord, you can see Brent say the one-way street thing again on there, which he did the other day. <laughs> so he's plagiarizing uh, himself. Yes, I am. Um, so all right, should we? Did... Yeah, should we rate Scanner Darkly? Yeah, what would you think of it? <laughs> Let's do it. Um, I gave it a five. You know, I I waffled for a bit because I was like, oh, is this really? And then I I mean I just thought about it so much. It's such a powerful novel um and i just i think it's it's like a sci-fi shell uh to tell a really visceral powerful tale about addiction that also has a really compelling and propulsive underlying plot um it's it's a great book it's a perfect book i totally agree i'm also gonna give it a five one of our few unanimous fives um the, yeah the dialogue the sense of place and just totally putting you into someone else's state of mind and it being this like disturbed very interesting state of mind is so masterful um yeah i cannot recommend highly enough falling down this like scary dark rabbit hole of substance d it's just so good absolutely all right well let's get started here uh i loved some things about the plot one of them being something that you pointed out which i agree with which is uh that getting sci assigned to investigate himself is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah, so the, that, the that conceit, is Arctor and Fred, or yeah, Fred the getting assigned. Is that he, when he is Fred, the narcotics agent, he's wearing this like crazy scramble suit, so nobody can see. It like distorts uh, what he looks like and sounds like. So there's no way to tell who that is, and so none of the people he works with, like in the police department, know out in the world when he's pretending to be a drug addict. They don't know which of those people actually he is. So he's like so deep undercover that they don't even know his secret identity. And then, yeah, he gets assigned to investigate and like set up bugs on Bob Arctor's house. But that's that's him. That's his house. But he can't tell them that because it would blow his cover. And it's just like <laughs> so kooky and great and really sets up this sense of like bizarre paranoia so well. It's just, yeah, it was really, really great. Yeah, it's, it's a great catalyst for... Um the mystery and all the rest of the plot points, which we'll talk about post spoilers because it's really hard to kind of get into that without, without going too far down the road and, yeah. and ruining it for the non readers out there. Um, so we'll talk about that after recommendations. Um, also, I, I think that the other, you know, any element of something we give a five is going to have like just by the numbers down the line, great 
elements in every category. The characters are also fantastic. They're so, um, they're brought to such like fantastic relief. They're really dimensional. Um, and uh, specifically, uh, the junkies, all the drug addicts just feel so real. They're all paranoid. Um, they know lots of like weird trivia and, um, use it, but use it for pointless applications. You know, they know how to, you know, build and, and short circuit, uh, and, and, and manipulate electronics in a really valuable way, but they use it for these like paranoid little schemes instead of, um, something kind of more, more, um, valuable. Uh, and they're also know-it-alls who just like hearing themselves talk a lot. Uh, and, and their, their friendship, uh, to, to the sadder point of, um, drug addicts is kind of, is based around their addiction, right? They're, they're not really friends and they're mistrustful of each other. Uh, but they also work together because they all have the, the common need for substance D, yeah. uh, which is very, um, realistic. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I would particularly, I mean, there's all the characters were lovable, but like the one we should for sure highlight and talk about is uh barris so bob has two roommates um this guy barris and there's another guy luckman but barris is like just such a creepy interesting guy he's like extremely paranoid and he like asserts that all these things are true that like really don't seem like they could be but he says it with such authority that these you know the other bob and and luckman who are hanging out with him it's just like it becomes really hard to tell what is true and false. And even more disturbingly, like which parts are Barris just messing with them versus which things does he actually believe? It becomes extremely hard to tell. And it's just like, ooh, he's such like a, a creepy character. I I just like, oof, man, he's not a good dude to hang around with. He's just, he inspires this like psychosis in everyone else because you just can't tell what is happening and if he's messing with you or what it's just he's wild yeah you can't tell it, it it induces extra paranoia because he's um it's like uh you know any conspiracy theory at the heart of the conspiracy theory even if it's completely um s silly to believe in there's always some kernel of truth that you know that's what barris is <laughs> yeah and um you know also there's a lot of really hilarious dialogue i mean the dialogue is just impeccable it's so so well written so and good. yeah and so they go through the you know their paranoia comes across well through the dialogue um their their characters come uh, across well through the dialogue but also they have these hilarious conversations uh just kind of shooting the shit yeah they're so good the whole first i, I really like the whole book but the first half where there's like some more moments of like they're more together and just their diet. It just makes them feel so real. It's like, there's so much stuff. that's really, really funny. Um, they're like, you know, they're making good jokes and it like really, but it just like the way it blends everything together and just like, you know, drugs are fun and drugs are also terrible. And these conversations are just like, so interesting. They're so interesting because it's both. Um, yeah, I just, I can, I can't get enough. I can't get enough of the dialogue. And to your point about drugs, uh, fun and terrible, um, this, you know, this novel comes out of the cultural moment of the sixties and seventies. Um, and it, 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 you know, half of it is, is the government is basically just, a you know, a stand in, in the sci-fi, uh, world for the, Nixonian war on drugs that yeah. was later Reagan's war on drugs, you know, that continuing war on drugs of the late sixties and seventies and eighties. Um, and also the, the use of more types of drugs and experimentation with, with more extreme ways of using them and, and more types. Um, yeah. Lots of new synthetic drugs hitting the market in the sixties and seventies, just like substance D this like new mystery drug. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it has a really good, uh, balance of both of those forces. And even, you know, in the microcosm of this central protagonist, you have Fred and Arctur. That's one person who is, uh, both the government side and the user side, um, dealer side. Uh, so it's a really interesting way of, of exploring that, that history. Yeah. Yeah, it sure is. Um, there's also some really, really cool stuff about, 
sort of the theory of the mind and like your brain physiology and biology. There's like real interesting facts in here. Um, and then they're used like, like happens in great writing. You like sort of like learn the facts and it feels organic and then they get used to help propel the plot in a way that feels like totally plausible um, after you like know those facts about the brain. Um, so it's just a really interesting like exploration of like, it's not really like identity in the traditional way we mean identity, but much more, hmm. I don't think I can say too much more about that without spoiling anything, but like, damn, it's real well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and it, it, it also, uh, I'm one of the, f one of my favorite things that it tells, um, it, you know, kind of ideas it explores beyond just the, the obvious or the, um, you know, the, the war on drugs and the, what it's like to be a, a user, et cetera, is, is the, uh, Dick's point about the human experience um, and the relativity, meeting the relativity of time. And I love that he he explores in drug use that a drug user has the same experience of the universe and existence as a drug addict, as um, someone who's not addicted to drugs or using drugs that often. It's just sped up at this exponential speed. And he explores it through these various scenes that are uh, in, in different ways that are really really interesting um and it made a compelling point that i hadn't thought about um too much before yeah yeah I, yeah i totally agree yeah the um you know the idea that you're just like burning your candle like much 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 faster um really comes through well but that it feels like you're getting the same thing just because it's happening much faster you're getting the same experience it's just condensed it's like the relativity of of um uh time based on user you know exper personal experience yeah um and and that you know time is uh not objective it's a it's a subjective experience to the person yeah for sure so we've talked a little bit about the science so the coolest like science tech thing in the book for sure is the scramble suits um and the way they work they they don't make you Basically, the idea is you put on this like piece of fabric that has a bunch of electronics in it, and it like flashes bits of people's bodies like all over it, just constantly. So nobody looking at you can really tell what your real shape is or your outline because you're just seeing like all these other pieces of other people's bodies like superimposed over you at all times. It does the same thing with your voice, where it's like giving you this voice that kind of sounds like everyone's voice. So you're not invisible. You're just kind of like this hazy every person. Um, and that, yeah, it's just a cool idea. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a cool idea, and it's a very basic like. Um, I like when when sci-fi novels have have a couple of basic conceits that are compelling, and they get the job done for the story, uh, and and they're cool to think about beyond that too. But they're not. There's not too much going on here. It's just like all right, some scramble suits. Um, we've got, uh, and then the scanners, obviously the, yes. uh, the titular scanners. Yeah. They're which... making these like 3d hologram. It's not just a video recording. It's like a 3d holographic recording. It feels like, I don't know. Is that what it felt yeah, like? It's like you? an imaging system to like make, yeah, an interactive, like 3d video space. It feels like a VR recording almost. I yeah, what... that's a good, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, Bob has to, Bob slash Fred has to like set that all up in his own house. And so then he's spending time like in his house being Bob. And then he's spending a bunch of time like under his scramble suit in a safe house watching his own house. It's just a weird, it's just As a Fred. weird, weird situation for him. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Yeah, and those are cool too. And then I, I also love like the humor that, Dick interjects. Uh, um, there's a scene where Barris uses uh, like an old school tape recorder as this trap device for narcs to to like record if any narcs come and check on the house. And it, it it's described kind of like I mean I imagine it like one of those 80s 90s like tape decks where you hit record and there's a dynamic like you know stage microphone plugged into the thing and it's just recording so so that analog technology thrown in um and used by the, the you know the junkie forces is uh it really adds to the yeah the yeah Barris value. is like constantly asserting that he knows how electronics work but like thinking back i don't know if any of the things he made in the book actually worked i kind of think they didn't but it's still not clear 
you still can't tell. <laughs> yeah, and his 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 uh, car knowledge and his car tinkering. Yeah. Oh God, they're um, constantly destroying each other's cars. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't let any junkies work on your car. Yeah. Right. Um, but do let them. I mean, one one detail. I didn't really know where to put this, so I'll just slot it in here. But um, one detail that I really loved and I thought brought the book to life was. Um, how Dick talks about how junkies uh, care for animals like, quote, straights never do, people who don't use drugs. Um, and I just thought that was such an interesting point that the idea that um, someone who can't really take care of themselves, let alone others, because of addiction, because of a, the, the disease of addiction, um, wants to care for animals, um, abandoned stray animals, because they see something that they can care for because it's easier than caring for themselves or facing facing their own um, issues. Uh, but they still have they still have a need to nurture. Yeah, Barris, in fact, he does it the most. There's like this one dog that like they got from a shelter and nobody can figure out how to get it to behave and they're worried they're gonna have to put it down. And Barris spends like several months with this dog to like get it to calm down. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And they don't, you know, animals don't judge you, which is another reason that that's appealing. And it just, it feels, it, it's a very realistic um, and it made, it brought the, brought the world into relief even more. Yeah, yeah for sure. I love that detail. So this book is also kind of autobiographical, right? Yes, it sure is. Um, you know, he, Dick, he got divorced and then um, to fill up his house, which had plenty of rooms and uh, whatever, he started for whatever reason, um, allowing teenage kind of street urchin drug addicts to stay in his house with him and eventually started um, using with them um, and because they were around him. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it, apparently even before 1970, he wrote, all of his books on amphetamines. He said he reported that he would write 68 pages of copy in a day while in amphetamines. Scanner Darkly took him a lot longer after he'd gotten off yeah, this of is his, amphetamines. This is his first book he wrote sober, and it was like, yeah, sort of about what his life had been like in the, in the 60s and early 70s. Yeah, it's very based on his experience owning his home and having these these people come and stay with him um and be part of his you know his retinue and and see into their world yeah there's an interesting story here too with um so this is like an apocryphal story but we've heard it several times from like legit old school sci-fi sources but so the story <laughs> goes that at one point philip k dick had run out of money had some books that didn't sell and he's an interesting guy if you look at him some of his books are like hugely popular like this one andrew's dream of electric sheep that blade runner is based on um, he has a bunch of like books that get read that I read in like literature class and college, you know? Um, but then he has other books that like no one has read and I don't know, I guess they're probably bad, but I don't know. I haven't read them. Anyway, the point is he also spent a lot of money. So he ran out of money and, um, Robert Heinlein gave him a loan, um, which is like very much in keeping with both of their, not a loan, really a gift, just in keeping with both of them. And, and that's why, uh, in man in the high castle everyone sort of agrees that Heinlein is the man in the high castle who's writing a book there's like a book in, within a book and anyway that author is is Robert Heinlein so um just an interesting story of like the intertwining of these like you know old school titans of sci-fi it's always fun to see those those connections be made between people um that you're familiar with as as kind of larger than life uh legends of a sort and then realize uh, like they knew each other they interacted in such and such way those are the most fun yeah. stories um i also think that this book is a great you know there's a very kind of uh the the ending of it or the afterward is the dedication that he gives to um many of the people he lived with um and himself he includes uh but basically anyone who's struggling with addiction and disease and i think it was kind of a ahead of its time in a different way than just sci-fi um which is that he you know it's a very early in the process of of declaring that addiction is a disease and a mental disorder and um not an issue of willpower of one's you know of one's willpower. I think that's something that um, addiction, uh, a stigma that it's still fighting against today. 
uh, but it, it it's a lot better than it was back then. And I just I love this um, I love this line he had about it. So I wanted to the the quote from the afterward: um, "Drug misuse is not a disease. It is it is a decision, like the decision to move out in front of a moving car." Um, and I think that summed it up sums it up pretty nicely. Um, and so it's a very powerful novel um, in more than one way. Also interesting that uh, he wrote it just about addiction and and about um, what it's like to be a junkie and around junkies and have those friendships and and be that yeah, see type people of person. Get hurt and suffer you know irreversible brain damage. Like many of the people he lists in the afterward, like that's what happened to them. Like a lot, yeah, a lot of the people. It's really tough. But he he wrote it like that, but he had failed previously to sell um, any kind of literary only novels. Um, so he retroactively made it into science fiction, which I thought was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. It still works though. I think like it's, this feels like squarely science fiction to me, but like um, it makes sense when you hear that, like in reading it, like presumably he changed the drug name. He added the scramble suit. Although I don't know how he would have made that plot work without the scramble suit. Anyway. Um, yeah, it's a good, it's a good tidbit. Um, Which is maybe why it's, why it's such a unique story. Right. And why it's so good. It's like all these, all the best stories are these kind of like odd conglomerations of things, um, that don't normally go together. And then they end up making some sort of unique pastiche that is really, uh, you know, palpable. Yeah, for sure. Uh, other weird X Factor stuff. Um, the audiobook, Paul Giamatti reads it. And so first, when I listened to the, on this read, I did the, the audiobook version. And as it was starting, I was like, huh, that's weird. I guess Paul Giamatti must have been in the movie. And so maybe they like re-recorded this to come out, you know, when the movie came out in 2006. And then I checked later and actually Paul Giamatti is not in the movie. So I have no <laughs> explanation for why the book is narrated by Paul Giamatti. Um, I thought he did a good job though. Did you listen to the audiobook too? Yeah, he did a great job. It's yeah, a fun, so, it's a real fun listen. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, a if great anybody knows, for let us know why, how did this happen? Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, um, but yeah, yeah, oh, the movie, I should also talk about the movie just very briefly. Yeah, the movie came out in 2006 with Keanu Reeves and a bunch of other people who are not Paul Giamatti. Um, it's a pretty good movie. Uh, I didn't like, I love, love, love the book. And I would say I like quite liked the movie. Um, but, uh, definitely, definitely worth a watch. Um, for sure. It captures the tone really well. Like that feeling of just like, Ooh, mm -hmm. what's going on? Yeah. Just like itchy skin. Yes. Um, yeah. That, which the first scene of the novel catches really well as you know too um, with yeah. the jerry the bug man um uh, yeah. <laughs> anyways this is a basically like a beat gonzo era ac hyper accurate book about drug addiction and the fight you know the war on drugs uh but set in a sci-fi future so it's awesome we loved it um and we have some similar books to recommend like always for those who like to hear them brent yeah. what you, you got? like what do you what do you, what do you pick Oh, you want me to start? Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. I will start. Um, you know, it was tough kind of finding analogs since it's two different things. Um, but uh, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe is a novel, um, uh, new journalism or gonzo journalism novel uh, from the 80s or late 70s, early 80s. Anyways, it follows Ken Kesey, who wrote uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, among other things, um, in real life. It's about Ken Kesey's journey with a group of uh, his friends called the Merry Pranksters in a bus driven by D uh, Neil Cassidy, who is a character uh, in On the Road by Jack Kerouac. These are all, you know, the real life beats, the legends <laughs> um, in real life. Uh, and they, Ken Kesey and the Pranksters go around to the United States trying to have these acid parties to mm, test it out basically. Um, and a lot of crazy stuff happens and it's just the real life story of, of kind of what was going on at the time, um, in the drug world. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, that one's been on, I've read like several beat books, but not that one. And hearing you talk about it makes me like, I gotta do it. Read, don't read yeah. on the road, read that on the road is uh, mm. on the road's trash, but yeah. <laughs> it, this is, this is, uh, yeah, this is like post beat the yeah. got you know, the new journalism era. Um, okay, I'm gonna go with Neuromancer by William Gibson, which has some 
some drug use in it. It also, the tech feels similar to what's going on in Scanner Darkly. Like, Scanner Darkly and, uh, like feels a little cyberpunk-y. There's no Matrix in, in Scanner Darkly, but, and it just has a lot of the very same, like, gritty feel and the sense of, like, not being clear what's real and what's not real. Like, they just feel, uh, the mood feels right. So anyway, yeah, if you love Scanner Darkly, check out Neuromancer, vice versa. Yeah. Very, very similar feel to cyberpunk here. Um, and then the last one is another post beat gonzo journalism. Um, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas by Hunter S. Thompson. Very similar drug unreality uh, feelings here. Um, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it or the film. Uh, it's just a great it's a great book. So some non sci fi's here today. I thought of something but we they're should, all great books. I thought of another thing we should do. We should talk about some of his other books. So um, mm -hmm. I've read a lot of Philip K. Dick. His his this is his second most popular book. His most popular book is Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, uh, that Blade Runner is based on. And that book is good, but it's so different than the movie. Like you just shouldn't expect at all the same thing. It's mostly about like religion and it's about environmental collapse. The I guess like the feeling of the book kind of matches what happens in Blade Runner, but that's about it. Anyway, I I like this book more than than Androids. I don't know. Do you do you feel the same way? I I liked Scanner Darkly a lot more. Um, uh, and I think you know it's it's the like addiction stuff's personal to me, and it, it also just he just nails so much about the world. Um, and the plot's great. I mean, it's just a perfect novel. And Androids is. Uh, fun and weird and totally different than the movie. It's yeah. to it's also worth reading for sure. But you're in, f you know, don't uh, don't expect a Blade Runner to yeah, happen for sure. <laughs> yeah, and then Philip K. Dick has so many other books that are like you know taught in schools and that kind of stuff. Anyway, he's a really, really, really talented writer. If you like this book, um, he's uh, I feel like kind of like similar to Ursula K. Le Guin. Like they're just so good and they have this like feeling to the way they write. Like. If you like his stuff, you're gonna like his stuff. So um, yeah, and if you like Scanner, yeah, if you like Scanner Darkly, just check out more Dick. is always a good uh, option. Yeah, although Man in the High Castle, which won a Hugo for him, is like I think my least favorite book of all his I've read. I'll say. Interesting. Um, it's not bad, but I don't like it that much. I just I like I his other stuff a, so much. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also an expectations thing. I thought mm -hmm. it was a good book. I like his other stuff more too, but it's um, you know, you go in thinking Philip K. Dick science fiction and then it's just what if the u.s was the ussr like the collapse like the post uh yeah what if we got partitioned USSR by collapse. japan and germany yeah yeah and, um, and that's and that's it there's no there's nothing else just alternate history flipping it on its head it's interesting but you know no going in <laughs> yeah for sure um okay so should we do post spoilers should we talk a little bit about what happens at the end Yes. So if you do not want to know about what happens at the end, now is your time to steer clear. Three, two, one, Brent. Okay. So substance D causes Bob slash Fred's mind, basically the, the corpus class and the, the connection between the two halves of his brain fully degrades. And so he splits into two people. <laughs> he becomes Bob and Fred and Fred the undercover detective, as he's watching all this footage, no longer knows that he is in fact Bob. And Bob doesn't know, Bob knows there's maybe someone watching him. And he, he's actually pretty sure that's true, but he can't remember, he doesn't know that it's himself. And he's not really sure if he's just being paranoid, but he's pretty sure there is someone watching him. And there's this really amazing scene where he's like, talking about how he hopes whoever is watching him is like really going to like bring light and help him see what's really happening. But unfortunately it's actually just him watching. So no, they're not going to. <laughs> um, so hence then, the title a scanner darkly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. A scanner darkly is himself uh, not doing a good job of <laughs> monitoring his own life. Um, okay. So Barris is doing increasingly messed up stuff to Arthur and Luckman, the, the, uh, and, it sort of becomes unclear. He might legitimately be trying to kill them or maybe he's just like in paranoid psychosis and doesn't know what's happening. But like, it really seems like maybe he is trying to kill them. Um, and eventually Bob and Fred, like this split in his mind becomes so obvious that basically his employers notice and they sort of like kick him off the force. They say like, Hey, you're, you need to like not do any more substance D you might already have irreversible brain damage. So they kick him out. And then his his pseudo girlfriend, this woman Donna, who he has like been very interested in the whole book, comes and picks him up, 
At which point we find out that Donna actually is also an undercover narcotics agent, but she's working for the federal government. And she takes him and drops him off in a new path rehab facility, which are these rehab facilities that have been mentioned throughout the book. They're free for the people who go there. Um, we have to follow these really strict rules and everybody's like really messed up in these new path facilities. And there he gets pushed by this guy to go to a new path farm, which is these, they say they're just growing crops, but the only people they take there are the people who are like vegetables, like so deeply damaged that they can't remember anything. At this point, he's going by Bruce because he doesn't remember his name anymore. And on that farm, Bob discovers that New Path is actually the source of substance D. They've found this like flower that they're refining into substance D. And he has just enough wherewithal to like pick a flower and put it in his shoe and like know that when he sees Donna at Thanksgiving, she'll be interested in this. He doesn't really know why, but he has like just enough of him left to know that he should do that. And so, yeah, that's how it ends. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible twist. Like, not only is the novel great to read from a character perspective and, like, the the, the accurate um, descriptions of this lifestyle and that the characters who live it, um, but also the twist and the plot. I was not expecting that. I mean, it's kind of like a third or fourth act feeling thing where you think the novel's going to be over, and then he takes on yet a third personality of Bruce, whose brain is destroyed, and you realize that you know, below all the paranoia about all of the other things, one of the one of the things that the conspiracies that was actually going on is the government wasn't using him as an undercover agent to, you know, to to penetrate the top ranks of of drug dealers and figure out where substance D was coming from by himself. They were using him to get addicted to substance D so they could put him in the New Path facility, destroy his brain enough to send him to the farm and take back some evidence. Um, you know, subconsciously at the end of the book, he he realizes this flower needs to go to, quote, his friends back in the facility. And so he puts it in his sock. Um, and so the government's used him not as like an undercover agent to like have the glory and figure it out for himself, but just as like a pawn they wreck his brain let him wreck his brain so that he'll bring back the evidence and i just oh yeah. that twist is so it was really it great. works with the story so well yeah it really did yeah and there's a, there's this scene where donna when donna picks him up and is going to take him to new path and she's talking with someone else about bob bob like bob can't really be talked to anymore at this point point. and donna's really upset she actually really liked bob she thought he was a sweet man and she she has this great line about how like you know if if he if he had volunteered for this, I would actually be okay with it. But he didn't. Like, we sacrificed him without him even knowing he was being sacrificed. And that makes it so much worse. Um, and I thought that was just such a good... It's like it's like the definition of innocence, you know? It's like being sacrificed when you don't even... You're not even capable of knowing that you're being sacrificed. And that, that really... Yeah, it's just a really... Uh, I mean, it's a hard scene, but it's a really good thought and, like, definition of innocence to me. Yeah it feeds into the themes it's trying to tell, you know, and, and its characters, it all, it, it's all, um, you know, a system that's feeding back into itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and the, and the first, the first twist has a good setup, uh, for that too. When he, when his mind splits, which is a twist when it happens, you're, you're right. not really expecting it, but then you realize you should have been because you're learning this stuff about brain anatomy and how if you know if your corpus callosum is separated there's arguments that maybe actually you do become two people and maybe we're actually two people the whole time anyway you sort of learn that stuff and then he becomes two people and you're like oh my god i didn't see that coming but of course that makes sense um just that really well executed like plot device yeah and 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 then and all of the characters along the way who are um you know wrecked in the battle between someone trying to make money with a hyper addictive drug and um you know basically corporatizing it and they have vertical integration where they you know use old they rehab old users to grow the plant to sell to more people and then the government kind of bungling a little bit but trying to to fight against it and both sides are just sacrificing you know soldiers left and right they don't care about people at all um and the drug and drugs don't care about people at all. So it's a it's a nice uh, mixture of those two themes, um, like mirroring the drug user's experience. Uh, it, it really just it con continues to concentrically ring in on itself. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, and then you mentioned the after word earlier, but I would just, I would, I don't think I had a chance to earlier. I would just also say like, you know, I like teared up at the afterward. It's like incredibly moving and like yeah. this, it really, like really brings the novel home that it feels so real. And there's like so many people who are, I mean, we're going through a drug epidemic right now. It's worse even than what was happening then, but it's worse now by a lot. Um, and it's not like a hopeful book. It's not like, here's what you can do to help. Like that's not the deal, but it just gives you a lot of empathy to sort of understand and see people as people. Um, yeah, really powerful book. Yeah, it just shows. Um, and and the fact that he dedicated it to himself as well is really touching. And the idea of, um, you know, yourself as an addict being kind of a different person um, than yourself uh, once you are in recovery uh, is a very powerful sentiment that uh, kind of echoes the, the brain splitting, the corpus callosum splitting. Um, for for yet another uh, great metaphor um, into what it's like to be addicted to something. Yeah, for sure. Well, I don't know. We love this book. I hope I hope you all uh, love it too. Let us know what you think. Yeah. Join us on the Discord. Tell us uh, tell us what you thought of it. And if you know why Paul Giamatti read this book, I really hope someone <laughs> out there knows. I would love to hear the story. Yeah, and uh, Tim Robbins reads Fahrenheit 451, which I'm finishing right now. So we'll see you next time for that one. For sure. Later, man. All right, see ya.